Right, thanks very much. Now this 14th talk of mine is about a filmmaker called Hans Jürgen Seiberberg, who is not a household name, it has to be said, even within contemporary Germany. But uh, if there was a title for the talks, as there sometimes is at our meetings behind me, the title would have been Hans Jürgen Seiberberg, Lenny Riefenstahl's heir? Question mark. Because there is a degree to which in these talks I always try and find figures occasionally who are contemporaneous, who are alive and amongst us now, who are in this most difficult of eras, this most liberal, most democratic, most egalitarian of eras. The eras that are in every sense postmodern and after the crash perceived in every possible way of 1945 and thereafter. Now, Cyberberg is a filmmaker who is possibly, at this moment in time, one of, if not the loneliest cultural figure in the modern unified Federal Republic. He's most famous for a film called Hitler, Ein Film aus Deutschland, made in 1978, which lasts seven and a quarter hours. <laughs> seven and a quarter hours. I saw it when I was 19 at the National Film Theatre. And it's one of those things where Richard Nixon once said you needed a cast iron behind to read law, but you really needed uh, sort of some, some vitamin C anyway to watch this film for seven hours just physically. Because when you come out after having sat for that length of time, uh. you really are uh, sort of rigid. Now, he's an East German essentially, and he was born in 1935 of minor aristocratic and upper class parentage. He lived in Rostock until 1945. He never was too young uh, to have gone through or had to go through the denazification process as a focused individual, but of course he went through everything that happened later and indeed experienced the beginnings of the communist statelet in the uh, occupied East. Cyberberg was always, and is, because he's still alive, although very elderly now, a controversialist in every sense. When he came west, there was a large reception for him from the cultural apparatus of the new federal West German state. And he made some equivocal remarks about the communist regimes of Ulbricht and Honecker. Uh, he talked about the fact that, you know, it's one of the first countries to build a wall to keep its people in. But at the same time, he said, they've managed to teach nearly all of us to read and write, which you over here in the West post-war don't seem to quite master. It was a slight pulling in of um, the welcome carpet. And people realised that Cyberberg was a man, in a sense, who said what he liked. And that isn't like in contemporary Germany or most other countries. Now, he began with uh, a thesis on Dürrenmatt and the absurd, which seemed to chart him out for a regular, academic, uh, non-artistic career. But he always had a yearning for total art, for the total art form of Wagner's vintage of the late, in the late 19th century, the Gestamkunstwerk. Uh, my German's not very good, but the idea of a total form that combines all other speech, poetic higher speech, um, song, dance, movement, the, vi the visual image of the human and nature and the two together, uh, of narrative story, of action and drama, and so on. And when you think about it, film, and the use of film, particularly by radical and authoritarian governments of the 20th century, is the total artwork for this era, as Lenny Riefenstahl knew and discovered and made use of, which is why she became the greatest female filmmaker of the 20th century, the most vilified, um, if you turn it around, cultural propagandist, as you would see in that era, forbidden to make films in the post-war era. Interestingly, a couple of years ago, um, uh, Mel Gibson was asked about her in the enormous brouhaha and controversy that blew up around his film, The Passion of the Christ. And he said that he would have given her, you know, a few tens of millions, you know, because he's got that sort of money now, to make some of the films that she wanted to make, although she did make t Plunk post-war. Now, this is because the amount of money that you need as a start-up production cost for films is so great prior to digital cameras coming on stream in the last five to eight years, say, now, HD cameras and so on. But for small but very large amounts of capital, 
you can be completely stymied. And if most films before the internet, if you can't disseminate them, it's almost the, the vanity form of all vanity forms. And that's what faced her after the war. Now, Cyberberg's career began in, uh, with two very short films made in 1965 and 1966, respectively. One thing that he did is after the destruction, because although if you, can, you go to Germany today, and much of it looks like a you know, uh, poster tourist card, but that's because everything has been lovingly rebuilt, because it was smashed, not just a little bit, but to pieces, to atoms, uh, so that one brick hardly remained on another for north, south, east and west. Allied bombing, uh, primarily British bombing, smashed city after city after city. So there was nothing left, nothing left. Every urban area was like Grozny in Chechnya now, where I believe, even after the uh, present clique have been in for quite a few years, one street in the centre has been rebuilt. Now, he wanted to go back to many of the great actors and actresses who were then nearing the ends of their lives in the 60s and put them on the screen for the last time, a sort of addendum, a memorial, a thank you note. These, all these were all short films, um, shot on quite primitive equipment, black and white. The first one was called um, Romy Schneider, Anatomy of a Face. Rather unusual, a um, film about a woman's face. And it's a film about this uh, sort of great sort of German actress beauty from the past, theatrical, the bone structure was still there, and our whole film is essentially about her face. It's rather interesting, isn't it? Because there are certain modern theories about the contemporary face, its weakness, and its flabbiness, <laughs> and its absence <laughs> of structure, you know? And that's what he's hinting at in there. Um, there's, um, there's, there's somebody who people here know who was um, called, in a small little group or sect, and she was called the Countess. And she was once asked about the face, the modern face, and she made remarks like that. And people were appalled. But what Soderbergh's doing by that very small idea is he's indicating that people didn't always necessarily look as the way they do today. And the sensibility that they articulate is not that which says that 1945 is a year zero for us all, and there was nothing before, and we've all reinvented ourselves subsequently, and we're all postmodern and reflexive, and think every possible thought at every other possible instant. But in other words, there's something maybe classical that prefigures value. But it's a short film, and it didn't get too much attention. Then in 1966, he dealt with uh, Fritz Kortner, who was a very well-known actor, particularly of Shakespearean, drama in Germany. He's very elderly then. And this is just scenes of him rehearsing, almost a radio film in a strange sort of way. He's going through motions. His great performance in German theatre was this Shylock. And Cyberberg has him, possibly in his last ever performance, because the point of film, as these elderly actors realise, is it memorialises them. Who, who remembers these people now? Mm. If there isn't the film there of them, and Courtney, as an old man, is quite clearly suffering with various illnesses that will take him away a year or two, or two after filming in '66. But he gets him to articulate this superhuman, stroke inhuman, scream of revenge, Shylock's desire for revenge against the Gentile world, a sort of primal scream. Remember in the 60s there was that cult called Primal Scream? You could go into your unconscious and draw it all out, you know, and get rid of it through a big scream. It's, it's, it, that cold didn't last, you know, but it's being replaced by something else. Nevertheless, Cortner gives this scream in this film and then it ends. And that's another little lignette for what's coming later on in Cyberberg's career. At this moment he was just dismissed as a mildly academic eccentric making some odd uh, revivalist films about previous German cultural figures. Inoffensive stuff. As we move on, the obsession with the the Romantic movement in the 19th century and the Volkish movement in the 19th century and their visual art and some of their religious ideas and they overlap into the, into the Van der Vogel movement of the 19th century where large numbers of youths would move around the country 